Good morning, and welcome to another session of Wednesdays in the Word. My name is Gary Cooney, and I'm so glad you could be with me as we look at God's Word together, unfolding it together, studying it verse by verse. And we're in the midst of an extended study of the book of Romans. I hope you've been with me as we've been working our way through Romans, and this is a new opportunity for you to listen to God's Word. I encourage you to go back and at your leisure, listen to the previous sessions to see the unfolding message throughout the book of Romans. Today, we're in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, and I want to pick up our reading in verse 18 and read on through verse 25, a section of this scripture that we'll be looking at today and then looking at in our next Wednesdays in the Word together, Lord willing. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons than the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. In this section of the book of Romans, in the eighth chapter particularly, we've been examining issues related to the Holy Spirit. It's a section of the book of Romans specifically written to believers. And it's introducing us to the important principle that though redeemed, God has still called us to be growing. And in the midst of a world filled with temptation from the flesh, from the devil, and from the world itself, we do not have inherently the strength in ourselves to successfully face it. But through the indwelling Holy Spirit, gifted to all believers, we find the strength to live pleasing to the Lord, righteously and in holiness. And in verses 9 to 17, the preceding verses in this 8th chapter, we found five truths about the Holy Spirit. And I want to briefly review those to set the stage for these verses, verses 18 to 25, that we're targeting in our study today. The first of the truths about the Holy Spirit, back in verse 9, was that the Holy Spirit indwells every true believer. In fact, it frames it in this way. It says, if we, we don't belong to the Lord Jesus Christ if it is not true that the Holy Spirit indwells us. So for the believer, the issue isn't, how do I go about trying to get the Spirit? Well, listen, you already received the Holy Spirit if you repented and believed in the gospel. So the issue isn't how to get the Spirit. The issue is how to draw upon the Holy Spirit that I already have to enable me to live successfully in the midst of this fallen world. And that leads naturally to the second truth. In verses 10 and 11 of the preceding verses, we discovered that the Holy Spirit is in fact the source of our strength in order to live successfully, righteously, in a godly manner in the midst of a world filled with temptation and opposition. The new self alone, the new creation that we've become in the Lord Jesus Christ, is not enough to win the battle. In verse 18 of the seventh chapter, it put it this way, For I have the desire to do what's right, because I've been made a new creation, but not the ability to carry it out. And amen comes up from each of us in our lives as we acknowledge that truth. We've been changed. We've been made new. But somehow we just don't seem to have the ability to carry out what we really want to be doing. The battle to see successfully resolved requires that we draw upon the Holy Spirit's enablement. 
The third of the truths setting the stage for our continuing study here is that a child of God, a redeemed believer, you and I, if we've responded in repentance and faith to the gospel, is actually obligated before God to live a spirit-filled life. We have an obligation, God says, a duty not to give sin the upper hand in our lives any longer. We are indebted to God, is the way it also phrases it. We are indebted to God to live for his glory. Our lives, in other words, are no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We don't live for the glory of God, seeking to have victory over sin and temptation in this world in order to be saved. We could never do that to be saved because it's not in us. Nor do we do it in order to stay saved. We do it because we are saved. And as a result, purchased by the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, shed for us at Calvary, we are now called upon to live for his glory. Presenting our body as a living sacrifice, as Romans 12 will go on to explain to us. Is that true of you? Are you accepting the obligation now as a redeemed child of God to give up the control of your life and let God have it and live for his glory, for his purpose? And the only way to do that is to live filled with his Holy Spirit who is now indwelling us. I hope that's the case for you. Well, the fourth of the truths in verses 14 to 16, preceding our verses today, is that one of the things the Holy Spirit does within us is not merely to give us enabling strength to face the battle, but also to give us assurance, deepest level of who we are, that we have been adopted as children of God. His very presence in our life is proof that that adoption has taken place, that we are in fact sons of God. As John 1 verses 12 to 13 tell us, to become a child of God is a right that is granted Everyone in this world is a creature of God. <laughs> Only those who have responded in faith to the gospel have become children of God. It's a privileged position. God adopts us as his children when we repent and believe in the gospel. The Holy Spirit then bears witness, is the phrasing used here, within our hearts that we are there as his children, adopted. And then finally, in verse 17, immediately preceding these verses today, the fifth truth is that the Holy Spirit assures us of being a co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are adopted children into the very family of God, but God is saying, as my adopted children, I want you to understand you've been made a full heir along with the rest of the family of all of the inheritance that is there for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, almost, we need to pinch ourselves to say to ourselves, I've been written into God's will. <laughs> Do you see it? Using terminology present for our era. I'm written into the will. I'm in the family, yes. And I've also now been given an inheritance as part of that family. What a great, great, wonderful truth. Well, those five truths set the stage for these verses now in verses 18 to 25. One of the practical results of this fifth truth about the Holy Spirit, that we are now co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. One practical result of that is that certainty about that inheritance helps us to face current sufferings, as it puts it in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us and in us. Hey, here's the truth. You don't need me to tell you this, but I'll remind you. You suffer now. I suffer now. We live in the midst of a fallen world. We face trials and tribulations at times. Who among us as a believer, a redeemed child of God, can possibly say, oh, well, I don't have any sufferings in the current moment? No, no, all of us do. We vary in the nature of them and in the magnitude of them, but we don't vary in the reality of them. All of us face that suffering. And now God is telling us, listen, in my plan, my plan hasn't been to take you out of suffering yet, that will come, but I'm going to give you grace and enablement in the midst of the suffering, 
And one of the ways I'm going to do that is to remind you of the wonder I have in store for you, the inheritance. And in reflecting on that inheritance, it will help you put some of the current suffering into proper perspective. As he says in verse 18, I am considering that these sufferings, the word consider here translates a Greek word, which means to compute or calculate, to, to give a reasoned judgment. Let's put it this way. God is saying through Paul writing this book of Romans, when we logically examine the facts, it helps us to make a proper judgment. When I logically reflect on the wonders of my inheritance, all of the things that God promises are in store for me as a child of God, then as I look at the facts about my current realities, the struggles, the trials, the sufferings, I will find that God gives me hope in the midst of current trouble and helps me to find satisfaction and comfort in the realization of what is to come, that the trials of the current moment are more bearable because I see where they're headed and I see what God's great intention is within me. What's the point? The point is clearly this, that whatever my current circumstances, whatever my current suffering may be, it needs to be compared with God's promises about our inheritance that is to come in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I do that, and when you do that, you will find a measure of help, a measure of grace, a measure of encouragement to continue on facing the trial, facing the suffering, because perspective is gained. It gives you something to hold on to in the midst of hard times. You will be able to face the suffering that's inescapable in this fallen world. You will face it more successfully. It's very similar to what God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Let me read those words to you. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Verse 17 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, For this light momentary affliction. Sounds like Romans 8 words, don't they? For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. As we look to things that, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. <laughs> it is not unusual or out of the plan of God that you and I would face current sufferings. In fact, the reality of the Christian life, among other things, is current suffering. And when there's teachers who purport to be speaking to you about God's word and about Christianity who imply to you that somehow it's God's will to not have you face current sufferings, they are not telling you what God has revealed to be true in his scriptures. No, we will face current suffering. But God's got multiple things to help us in the midst of it. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And one of the things is the enabling of the Holy Spirit in order to successfully battle the sufferings. And secondly, the promises he gives us, his precious and great promises, as Second Peter talks about, the promises that he gives us about our inheritance and our future in the Lord Jesus Christ helps us to face it, helps us to handle the current tragedies, the difficulties, and we press through them, looking ahead to what is certain and promised from God as 2 Corinthians 4 says, this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So how are you doing on the comparison? As Romans 8, getting back to it now, verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are really not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us and in us. You say, well, I don't know much about that inheritance. 
What is it that Paul is talking about here? Well, he doesn't go into a lot of detail right now about that inheritance, but that's a great assignment for you. Study the New Testament and find what the riches are of this inheritance that God says will help you. A certain inheritance, he will help you in the midst of hard times. And since you're in hard times, all of us are in hard times, it's worth it to spend some time studying that topic. Now, at this point, starting in verse 19, God adds an interesting side note in a sense. He says, not only are you in the midst of current sufferings, but the very physical world in which you're living is in the midst of current sufferings. And the physical world in which you are now living, in which I've placed you, is also waiting for a coming inheritance. Notice how he puts it here. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Why? Because the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. God turns our attention to that physical world that surrounds us. And he says, this physical world in which you live, yes, the trees, the sky, the mountains, the rivers, the seas, the physical world around you, the animals, that world is waiting with eager longing. It has been subjected to futility. It's in bondage. And it's looking forward to the freedom that will come at the same time our inheritance comes. Let me put it a different way. God is reminding us that the physical world around us, the world that we see, is not all that God created it to be, not all God intended it to be in the original creation. Oh, it still reflects some of God's glory and beauty, which is why the truth about God rings forth in the midst of creation. But the fact of the matter is, as we look at the physical world around us, we also see some of the distortion and decay of God's great intention that comes from sin. Because when sin entered this world, in Adam and Eve's determination to rebel against God, the consequence was a consequence for the physical world, not only people, not only the spirit of the person. Since Genesis 3 onward, not only has mankind fallen, but the creation around us has fallen. The creation around us is no longer like the paradise in the Garden of Eden. No, now there's thorns, now there's struggles, now there's distortions, and the physical world around us is only getting worse. And the physical world around us is only getting more decayed due to the fall. It is not what God created it to be, though it still reflects his glory and majesty in various ways. Just like humanity is not who God created it to be, But at times, even in the unredeemed, we see the image of God reflected in different ways. The physical world is groaning in its own sufferings, a parallel in a way to you and I groaning in our sufferings. God has an answer for the physical world. He has a solution coming for the groaning of the physical creation around us. In the same way that he has an answer for the groaning in the redeemed child of God living yet in a fallen body in the midst of a fallen world. God's got answers that cover the whole picture. And God is giving us a little insight now into the answer he has for the physical world around us. And by the way, the fact that the physical world is groaning and the fact that humanity is suffering from the consequences of sin helps us to understand that all of the human culture around us would be correspondingly affected by that fallenness reflected in both the spiritual nature of humanity and in the physical nature of the world in which we inhabit. Well, at any rate, 
God's got an answer, and he turns our attention to that answer for the physical world. And the first part of that answer is that he will bring about a temporary improvement in healing at Christ's return and the ushering in of his millennial kingdom. Even in the millennial kingdom, some of the struggle that remains in the midst of a fallen world will not be done away with, but many things will be improved. There's a temporary answer given, a temporary resolution. Notice how it puts it in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, directed by the Holy Spirit, in chapter 11 of that book, tells us these things beginning in verse 6. At that time, when the Lord Jesus returns, the Messiah, and the Messianic kingdom is implemented on this world, he says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little children shall lead, a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand into the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covering the earth. God's solution to the groaning of the physical creation, affected by the fall of mankind and the corruption of sin, is temporarily, partially addressed during the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the spiritual condition of humanity is partially addressed during that millennial kingdom. So there will be some temporary partial solution to the groaning of the physical world around us due to the fall of mankind. But there's a better and fuller answer in God's plan, in God's inheritance, the inheritance of the children of God, you remember they're calling for in that Romans 8, looking forward to the revealing of this inheritance for the children of God. The creation is waiting on that, looking forward to it. The final and perfect healing of the physical world will be seen as that inheritance of God unfolds in the new heavens and the new earth. One day, the liberation of humanity, redeemed humanity, and the liberation of the fallen world and creation will be complete. Create, as it puts it there, creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In the new heavens and the new earth, following the millennial kingdom, creation is finally set free because sin is eradicated from the world. And God redeems and transforms everything. Notice how it puts it here in the book of Revelation, because the end of the book of Revelation is all about this final, perfect, complete healing and solution to the fallenness of humanity and the corruption of the world. And he says in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5, it says, and then after the judgment, after the millennial kingdom was finished, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man now, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Then death shall be no more, and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne says, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That is all about our inheritance. That truth, which is enabling us in God's message here to hang in there during the blight and momentary afflictions, during today's current sufferings, that perfect healing, that perfect solution, it's coming. That's our inheritance. We're written into the will. And God says, get your mind on that, and that'll help you in the current moment. And creation itself is longing to see that fulfilled. In Revelation chapter 22, 
in verses 1 to 5, it starts out this way, continuing to build this picture. And it says, And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city and on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the lamp, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. Then his servants will worship him and they'll see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Then night will be no more. Then they'll no need of lamp or light of the sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. All right, that's your inheritance. (laughs) That's the wills being read. Then your name's in it. And God says that's supposed to help us. It's supposed to help us perspective wise to fit in logical, reasoned judgment, the current sufferings. And no wonder Paul said it's like light and momentary (laughs) compared to what's going to be revealed for the redeemed children of God, inheritors of the promise of God for the future. Now, what God is saying about this is that the earth, the physical creation around us, currently groans awaiting that day. And the word groan here literally means childbirth pains. The fallen creation around us with all of its disruption of God's original plan. You know, all of the physical storms and and terrible things that can happen. It's like in the throes of childbirth. It knows the future's coming. It knows God's great plan and inheritance is going to be revealed and it wants it to come. Do you see the imagery that God is developing for us? As certain as the baby follows the pain. So the new heavens and the new earth will follow the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial kingdom. And it will fulfill God's plan for history. And we will be part of it. And God says, hang on to that. It will help you balance in the midst of current sufferings. You and I have current sufferings. But we also have the great promises of God about our inheritance that are meant to help us stay together in the midst of current sufferings. Well, I hope you will join with me the next time we meet for Wednesdays in the Word as we continue to look further at these verses in the book of Romans. But just a note, we will not have a Wednesday in the Word next week because we will be in the midst of a nine-day special emphasis I'm calling Nine Days to Easter, where each of the days from the Saturday preceding Palm Sunday through Easter Day itself, we look at passages of the scriptures that help us to understand the wonder of Easter and the necessity of the cross and the resurrection. I hope you'll be joining daily during those nine days as a preparation of your own heart. And then, The Wednesday following that, we will get back to our Wednesdays in the Word studies in the book of Romans. God bless.